Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Liat Yarib. Uh, she is the Uwe E. Reinhardt Professor of Economics at Princeton University. And she's also the founding director of the Princeton Experimental Lab for Social Sciences. Uh, Professor Yarib is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a fellow of the Econometric Society. Uh, her work has won many, many awards. Uh, she's an expert in market design, social networks, and uh, the political economy, and specializes in bringing uh, experimental economics and theory together. Um, so I'll now turn the floor over to Professor Yarif. Let's welcome her. Thank you very much, Shuchi. So I'm going to tell you today about a new project with Alessandra Litzeri and Iran Shmaya. Alessandra is with us, so he'll be taking questions on the chat. Um, so let me start by saying that experimentation models are at the heart of, of uh, much of economics, in a sense, and, and other fields as well. So many decisions are preceded by experimentation, and as a consequence, there is a vast literature in economics and statistics and computer science on experimentation through bandits. Now, Shuchi just told you that, that I really like lab experiments. That's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm going to uh, talk about is, is actual theoretical models that are based on what is commonly known as the bandit problem. Uh, so just so we're all on the same page in those models, there are two basic ingredients. So the first one is that you're facing a bunch of projects of uncertain returns. And in the classical example, you go into uh, a casino and you're facing a bunch of slot machines. The, the, and you need to choose one. Now, at each period, you can sample one of the projects. And in this particular example, you, you can sample one slot machine. Now, what does it mean to sample? It means that you pull the arm of the slot machine. So then you both get a reward and you learn something. So the reward and the information are, are intertwined. There are many, many applications of this. This is by no means a comprehensive uh, list of, of applications, but perhaps the first time it was mentioned was for clinical trials. You try a new drug, a bunch of new drugs. Uh, trying new drugs means that uh, uh, you subject patients to the new drugs, so that can be good or bad, and you learn information through them. Uh, monopoly pricing, where firms don't know the demand functions as a function of price. Labor market choices, where you learn about employees uh, on while they're on the job. Venture capital, where uh, the quality of a project uh, can be discovered only through its development that requires capital to begin with consumers who learn the quality of different goods uh, and, and how teams experiment, so how it affects collective decision making. Now, at the heart of these problems is what's often termed the exploration exploitation dilemma. So again, signals and payoffs here are intertwined by assumption. Um, so there is a trade-off between learning, uh, what's often called the exploration aspect, and the payoffs that you get, which is the exploitation aspect. So that's the exploration exploitation trade-off. Now this is, uh, uh, was a known problem for many years and it was considered very hard. So this is a site from Peter Whittle in a kind of a review piece in 1979, where he describes that the problem is a classic one. It was form formulated during the war, he means the second world war and efforts to solve it so sapped the energies and minds of allied analysts that the suggestion was made that the problem be dropped over Germany as the ultimate instrument of intellectual sabotage. Now, thankfully, John C. Gittins in 1979 actually offered a general solution. So uh, his solution was quite remarkable. What he said was that you create a score for each of the projects, say the slot machines, and you adjust the score as you, as you collect samples. Now, what's remarkable about it is that the adjustment of the score, the score is done project by project. So it doesn't depend on what you, it's fully separable, it doesn't depend on what you've seen in other projects. And what you do at each point of time is always pick the project with the highest score. 
So the implications of this is that you may exploit myopically inferior projects in order to learn. You can switch between projects many, many times. There is no guidance here on how many times you'll switch. And, and you might actually get stuck on, on an inferior project even in the long run. Now, this problem probably for computer scientists will seem like a non-issue because, of course, this triggered a lot of literature that, that mostly thought about, about either algorithmically or by modifying preferences, say by including regret, leading to efficiency. That's not what I'll talk about today, but just kind of as a note on the links between the literatures. Okay, so what are we doing here? So we're going to modify this canonical model in, in one particular way. So, so um, a, a critic might call it the tweak on the canonical model, where we're going to allow agents to separate exploration from exploitation. And we think that this is actually relevant for most applications of these models. So it's very rare that exploration and exploitation is fully intertwined. Um, just to give you a bunch of examples, if you invest in one stock or enterprise, you can explore or research others. If you explore uh, uh, new policies, they don't have to be the ones that you utilize. Uh, on the jo job search is another example where you might be uh, working in one job, but, but looking into other opportunities and so on and so forth. And our goal is to understand the implications on both the optimal strategies and the long run outcomes in, in such settings. All right, so just to kind of foreshadow what I'll show you, uh, we're going to focus on two Poisson bandits. And for those of you who are not familiar with this, I'll soon uh, be more formal about this. Uh, now, the first result in these, uh, in these sorts of settings is that there is no index. So, so the beautiful, remarkable result by, by Gittins no longer holds here. So that's not something we can rely on. I won't describe the details of why that's the case, um, but it's, uh, for those of you who are interested, you can ask one of us uh, after the talk. What, what we will try to show you is that in, in this setting, you get long run efficiency with any level of disentanglement. The optimal policy entails lots of persistence, so very little switching. Uh, and we see improved expected discount pay, payoffs. Um, this in itself is not shocking because we're allowing more freedom to our decision maker, but that's particularly the case for intermediate discount rates and priors. Okay. Now, I'll very briefly go through the literature. This is a partial list and it's an unfair list. I just wanna highlight kind of the strands of literature that this relates to. So certainly Poisson bandits have been studied uh, extensively. So uh, the first people to mention it in the scientific literature were Robbins in 1952 and Gittins, like I said, actually offered a solution for this case in particular. Keller, Roddy and Cripps and Keller and Roddy arguably brought it to fame in the economics literature. These are some of the most cited theory papers in the last 20 years. They've, the models have been heavily utilized and I'll refer to them as, as I describe the model. Uh, there is a re recent uh, very cool literature that looks at dynamic choices of information sources. So in some sense, it relates to what we're doing here. Um, the, the decision of how to allocate the exploration across various projects also resembles kind of conceptually uh, stories or nar the narrative underlying rational and attention. Uh, so it's, it's kind of like you pay attention to, to various projects. Um, and in computer science, there is a vast literature that probably many of you know much better than me. Uh, but, but certainly kind of a direct link is to the best arm identification problem where you're trying to choose kind of the best arm to find algorithms that lead you to the best arm. All right. So, so that's it for the introduction. And now uh, we'll, we'll get into the meat. So we'll start with the model. Uh, and then I'll tell you about uh, a, a special case where there is one safe project, which is, uh, as it turns out, the, one of the, the special cases that is most heavily studied in the literature. And then we'll shift to multiple risky projects and, and uh, then we'll, we'll chat. All right, so here is the model. So an agent selects one of two projects 
L for low or H for high and continuous time. So at any point in time, they need to select one of these two projects. Project X uh, can be either good or bad. So it's good with probability P sub X and it's bad with the complementary probability one minus P sub X. If project X is good, then it pays a floor reward of R sub X. If it's, pay, if it's bad, it pays zero forever. And the reason why we're calling uh, the projects uh, H and L or high and low is because uh, if the projects are good, the rewards from the, the high project is higher than the rewards from the low project. And they're both positive. So really you're, you wanna use the high project if it's the good one. Um, if it's not good, but project L is the good one, then you want to use that. If you, they're both bad, you're kind of stuck. It doesn't matter. All right. How about the exploration? So at any moment, the agent chooses what to explore and what to exploit. Now, the exploration for us is costless. So at each moment, the agent allocates a unit budget between exploring project L or the low project and project H or the high project. So it's almost like a unit of attention where you pay attention to one of the two. If she spends a fraction alpha sub X of, of her budget uh, on, on project X, she may receive conclusive news. So what this means is, is that these news are going to depend on the quality of the project potentially. If the project is good, then she's going to get good news at Poisson rate of alpha X times some arrival rate lambda, which will denote with a superscript of G for good. And similarly, if the project is bad, then again, she's going to see bad news that tell her that the project is bad at the rate that's proportional to her investment alpha and the arrival rate of bad news, which is lambda superscript B for bad. Okay. So, so these are conclusive news, uh, which means that once you get news, you know exactly the quality of the, of the project, be it good or bad. Now, this already encompasses a large class of models that have been studied in the literature. So uh, usually we use the term good news case to denote a situation where the good news arrival is more rapid than bad news arrival. And in fact, the, the usual case that, that is studied in the literature and was introduced by Keller, Roddy, and Cripps uh, is one where the arrival rate of good news is strictly positive, but of the uh, arrival rate of bad news is zero. So you never see bad news. The classic bad news case, which was introduced by Keller and Roddy, um, usually re refers to the converse. So here you have a positive arrival of bad news and, and good news never arrives. Now, uh, one important aspect here is that really what matters, what is distinguishing between these two cases is the information that's conveyed when no news arrives. So really the, the reason why we can generalize things is because in some sense, it's only the difference between the arrival rates that matters, that affects how you're going to interpret no news. And in some sense, these good news and bad news labels are uh, perhaps a bit of a misnomer because in a way, in the good news case, if you see no news, no news, it's bad news. And in the bad news case, just to confuse the enemy, if you see no news, then it's actually good news. And just to put it in pictures, uh, uh, this uh, what I'm showing you here is just the posterior that a project is good as a function of time when you don't see any news. If you see news, you learn exactly the quality of the project. So in the good news case, uh, as, as time goes by and you've seen no news, um, you become more and more pessimistic. Whereas in the bad news case, as time goes by and you see no news, you become more and more optimistic. So that's really the distinguishing um, feature. All right, how about exploitation? So at any moment, the agent also chooses a project to exploit. And ultimately, the payoffs uh, depend only on the exploitation choices. 
those are unobserved. Otherwise, the problem would kind of boil down to the classical problem. So, so here, the information comes only from exploration. Exploitation only affects the payoffs. So exploitation payoffs are also discounted at a fixed rate R. So now we're going to try to map the classical setting and the full disentanglement setting. And this will be kind of useful to see the effects of disentanglement in these sorts of problems. So the alpha constraint decision process is one where whenever you exploit project X, you must allocate at least a fraction alpha to exploring it. So the fraction that you invest in X has to be at least alpha. So just to kind of note the extreme cases, if alpha equals to one, this is basically the standard model because whenever you, you exploit project X, you have to explore it with your entire budget. Um, if alpha equals to zero, on the other hand, we're at, in the full disentanglement case. So in, in effect, when this, the, this alpha uh, in, induces no constraint whatsoever on exploration. All right, so one uh, immediate observation is that for any alpha which is less than one, where you have some level of disentanglement, the agent uses the best project asymptotically. So in the long run, there is going to be an efficient project chosen. Why is that? Well, whenever there is still more useful information to be had, you continue exploring. So if there's any room for more learning, it's going to be uh, utilized. Now, this is an, an already highlight can, highlights kind of the contrast with the case of alpha equals to one precisely, because there we know that generically you can get stuck on a suboptimal project. Now, there is a serious caveat, which is that it may take a very long time to learn and the agent discounts here. So, so this is not kind of uh, a panacea. We are not done here uh, because we do need to think about the time it will take the agent to learn and their exact policies. That's also perhaps why some algorithmic approaches might be particularly useful in these settings. All right, so, so now that we have the setting all set up, I'm gonna start with a special case of the setting, which we uh, uh, will call a one safe project setting. And this is a setting that's uh, um, arguably the most heavily studied in economics at least. So in this setting, you have one project, we'll say the low project, that is completely safe, that has no uncertainty. So you know it's good the prior that it's good is one. So project L is safe, but it generates lower rewards than a good project. So that's why you're still facing a non-trivial trade-off here because the project H you'd like to use it, but you'd like to use it only if it's good. So now let's start with the general good news case. So suppose that the arrival rate of good news is greater than the arrival rate of bad news. So no news arrival uh, when project H is good. And so news arrival is higher when project H is good and there, uh, no news here is bad news uh, as, as we've just seen. So in this case, exploration is, is trivial. So the only value of information here is from observing project H. So no matter what you do, uh, you should explore project H as much as possible. Why am I saying as much as possible? Because you have this alpha constraint. So this means that if, if you're exploiting project L, the safe project, you're limited in the amount that you can explore project H, but you're gonna exhaust whatever you can on, on exploration of project H. That's where information is valuable. Exploitation is less trivial precisely because of this alpha constraint. So the way you exploit might limit how much learning you'll do. Now, when alpha equals to zero, uh, there is full disentanglement and uh, you're gonna exploit project H at T if and only if it's myopically optimal. So at that point, there is no constraint on exploration. So you may as well 
just exploit it whenever it seems like the more promising project. So what does that mean? It means that the expectation of project H at time T, so here this PHT is just your posterior at time T, that project H is good, is greater than the reward that you are guaranteed with the safe project. So there's gonna be a threshold of, of beliefs such that whenever you're more optimistic than this threshold, over the likelihood that project H is good, you're gonna exploit project H and otherwise project L. Now, when alpha is greater than zero, when we don't have full disentanglement, you may exploit project H even when it's myopically suboptimal. And this is kind of an intuition that was present even in the classical model. So how does it look in, in pictures? Here's uh, kind of the line represents the probability that project H is good. So if there is full disentanglement, exploitation is very simple. You have this cutoff RL over RH. And above it, you myopically exploit, exploit project H. Below it, you exploit project L. And that's the myopically optimal thing to do. But as we increase alpha, we shift the cutoff to the left here. And the region in which we start uh, uh, exploiting project H, even when it's myopically uh, suboptimal, is, is, is for the purposes of learning. So this is exactly kind of this trade-off between exploration and exploitation. Okay, so the underlying trade-off is to exploit project L when it's myopically optimal, exploring H at a rate of only one minus alpha. So you lose an alpha of, of arrival rate on, on project H or exploit and explore myopically an inferior project H to maximize the learning. All right, so I'm going to kind of construct the cutoff for you, at least heuristically, uh, just to give you an intuition for these results. And this will be the only construction, kind of formal construction I'll, I'll go through in detail. So I hope you bear with me. So, so if exploiting L uh, and exploring H at rate of one minus alpha is optimal, what this implies in particular is that the deviation to exploiting H for a small duration delta and then shifting back to L unless you see good news is not preferable. So now we can, we can assess the value of the, such a deviation. So when would, would such a deviation not be profitable? Well, there is a trade-off. On the one hand, you gain on immediate flow payoffs. On the other hand, you lose on fewer future payoff differences potentially due to the extra inf information that you get. So just for those of you who are curious, let me kind of highlight where this formula is coming from. So the first term, you kind of see that it's just related to the difference in payoffs. So PRH is just the expected payoff of project H and RL is the reward from the safe project. Um, now, when we think about the information, uh, the added information that we get from exploiting H, well, uh, that depends on the probability that we actually get good news in this duration delta, which would cause us to switch from project L to project H. And that depends on the rate of arrival of good news. So this is useful to us only if we see good news on project H. And uh, multiplied by the probability that you wouldn't have gotten this information otherwise. So, so this is kind of gives you a, a bit of extra, this deviation gives you a bit of extra if you wouldn't have gotten this information otherwise. And this is what this term captures. Now, again, this term is, is only, only depends on the likelihood that you would have gotten good news even without this, this extra exploration of project H. So again, it depends only on this rate uh, of good news arrival. Okay, so here's the inequality, just without uh, the whole lot of words that I added in the previous slide. And, and again, the inequality doesn't depend at all on, on the arrival rate of bad news. So in particular, uh, we could alter the arrival rate of bad news however we wish, and we can even look at, the, at, at them uh, being fully equalized. And this is what we call kind of the both news case 
where uh, uh, the news arrives at the, exactly the same rate for when the project is both bad and, and good. All right, so how do we find the threshold now? We take the limits as this tiny duration goes to zero and we simplify and we get some formula that, that uh, makes sense uh, in terms of comparative statics. So, you know, you, you can kind of do the various comparison and I'll soon show you some of the comparative statics just as a sanity check. When alpha equals to one, you just get the classic threshold that the literature has identified. There's a kind of interesting note. If you look at the, the fundamental papers on this, they usually derive the cutoff in a very different fashion. So it's kind of interesting that it can be derived in this way, but they get exactly the same result. As, uh, as alpha decreases, so as the, the constraint of disentanglement becomes more lax, um, then P bar alpha increases. In other words, it approaches the myopic threshold. And, and in fact, when alpha is precisely zero, when everything is disentangled, then we get exactly the myopic threshold. All right, so how about the bad news case? So suppose that bad news arrives at a higher rate than good news. Uh, then in this case, no news is good news. And we could do the same sort of exercise. So I won't go through now the whole calculation, but, but in a sense, the kind of trade-off that you want to think about is whether exploiting and exploring Project H is optimal, even though it's, it's myopically inferior. And in that case, you want to make sure that the value in information, the value that learning it, that it possibly learning that it's bad is, is sufficiently valuable. And you wouldn't want to exploit project L for a small duration delta and then switch to project H. So really here, what, what matters is what will cause you a switch now is, is if you learn bad news. So now you, you can do the same sort of calculus that I just showed you. And, and the inequality that you will get will depend only on the arrival rate of bad news. So in particular, it should be satisfied even when the, the arrival rates of good news and bad news precisely equalize. So this means that we should get exactly the same formulation as we did in the bad news case. So, so what we get to, to kind of summarize here is that the optimal, uh, the optimal policy here depends only on the maximum between the two arrival rates, that of the good news and the bad news. And for any optimal, ex uh, any such uh, exploitation strategy, has this nice formula. The cutoff is naturally lower than the myopic cutoff. And it's decreasing in alpha, as we've just discussed. It's also decreasing in the, in the potential value of knowing the correct, the correct project. And it's increasing in the in R. So as you become more impatient, you approach more and more the myopic cutoff. When, when alpha is greater than zero, it's also de decreasing in the arrival rate. So as the arrival rate goes up, there's more value in learning because you learn more rapidly and therefore you move away from the myopic threshold. All right, so uh, how about payoffs that result from this? Uh, we can calculate the expected payoff to, to actually assess the importance of this disentanglement. Now, one thing to immediately note is that if the agent is extremely patient, then regardless of, of this entanglement parameter alpha, she learns the optimal project and gets paid very close to the optimum because she's very, she's very patient. So here, the value of this entanglement is not going to be vast because either way, no matter what alpha is, the agent within a sufficiently long period of time gets very close to perfect learning and, and she's patient, so, so it doesn't really matter. Now, if the agent is extremely impatient, as the R becomes really, really large, then regardless of alpha, what the agent is gonna do is act myopically uh, with limited learning 
uh, opportunity. So again, the value of alpha here is not going to matter dramatically because the agent is just going to act myopically and that's what's going to feed into, into payoffs. So, so really the effects on payoffs, we would expect it to occur for intermediate values of interest rates, of, of interest, of discounting, not interest rate. I'm showing that I'm a real economist. Um, so, so let me show you some pictures for this. So we'll consider extreme cases for where alpha equals to one, the standard model, and alpha equals to zero, full disentanglement. Now, again, full disentanglement allows more freedom to the agent, so it shouldn't be shocking that the payoffs are higher with full disentanglement. Uh, a fully disentangled agent can always emulate an entangled agent. Uh, but we'd like to see the difference between these payoffs. Uh, I'll show you pictures that correspond to different priors that Project H is good. Um, and in order to compare apples to apples, we'll normalize these differences by the, the maximal payoff that you might, you might expect to receive. So this is as if you were, you were told what was the realized uh, value of Project H. So with probability PH, you'd receive RH. And with probably the complementary probability would just stick with the with the safe project. All right. So what you see on the left panel are the payoff differences for good news. On the right panel, the payoff differences for bad news. For a particular set of parameters in terms of the rewards from the safe project, the the high project, and the arrival rate of news. Um, and each of these lines corresponds to a different level of the prior P sub H. And what you can see already is that in, as a function of the discount rate R, we have a non-monotonic behavior where we have the maximal difference for intermediate discount rates. And in addition to that, for any particular discount rate, we get the maximum uh, for an intermediate value of the prior. So for example, if you look here where I'm, my cursor is, the maximal difference is for this orange line, which corresponds to the intermediate prior of 0.4. So I won't go through all of the details of, of this figure, uh, but uh, the benefits of this entangling here are non-monotonic and in the discount rate R, as we've already seen, and similarly also in the arrival rate, lambda. Uh, they're increasing in the value of getting project H uh, when it's good. So this is just kind of the value of information here. And they're maximal for intermediate priors. In particular, one can show that they're maximal for priors that are in between the Gittings uh, cutoff, which is exactly our cutoff when alpha equals to one, and the Mayapa cutoff, which is this RL over RH. Okay, so just to summarize the one safe project uh, setting, uh, different projects here are explored and exploited when you're less optimistic about project age. The optimal exploitation cutoff depends only on the maximum between the arrival rates of the bad news and good news. And the payoff benefits are most pronounced for intermediate parameters, discount rates and posteriors, for example. So this is kind of a picture that summarizes everything. So what you see here is again, our, our uh, uh, line that corresponds to the probability that project H is good and recall that RL over RH is the myopic cutoff. And as we increase alpha, the level of entanglement, we get to uh, the Gittins cutoff, which is P bar of one. So this uh, moves slowly to the left. What you see at the bottom here is uh, uh, capturing the optimal exploration and exploitation when alpha equals to one. This is the canonical model. So naturally they follow exactly the same the same uh, uh, pattern because they're intertwined. And, and the cutoff that governs this behavior is P bar of one, the Gittins cutoff. 
What you see at the top is what occurs in our model when everything is fully disentangled. So exploitation just follows the myopically optimal thing to do. And exploration is always of the H project. So in particular, you see that, that the option to disentangle is utilized for sufficiently pessimistic agents. All right, so this is it for the one safe project. Now let's go to multiple uncertain projects. So suppose that, that both of the priors are lower than one. So both projects are risky. So I'll focus now on only on the good news case. I will tell you what we find for the bad news case towards the end, uh, but just so that I can give you some intuitions, let me focus on the case in which the rate of news arrival for a good project is higher than for a bad project. So what does the standard setting tells us? And uh, we have not been able to find the precise reference for this. So uh, I, I think uh, experts on this, this know this result, but, but we just don't know for reference. If any of you know of a reference, please tell us. Uh, but at any rate, what the standard setting will, will tell us to do is to start exploring and exploiting the project with the higher Gittins index. Uh, if you get no news, then, uh, then you continue uh, with this project, but at some point, you, you know, you become increasingly pessimistic because you're observing no news. So in the good news case, no news is bad news. So you become increasingly pessimistic, and at some point, the indices of the two projects are going to coincide. And from then on, you're going to mix across the projects until you receive news on, on one of them. So in particular, you're going to have here an infinite number of switches. Now, with, the, uh, with good news, you continue. If you get good news, you're going to continue forever with that project which means that even if by chance this is the low project that you reveals itself to be good, you're going to get stuck on that project, which means that you won't have complete learning. So you might not use the optimal project asymptotically. All right, so now let's see what this entanglement does for us. So suppose that alpha equals to zero. So this is an extreme case, and I'm going to use that case just in order to illustrate the powers of, of this entanglement in this setting. So in this case, exploitation is the one that's trivial. So before we said the exploration was trivial and the one safe project, here the exploitation is trivial uh, because you always want to exploit myopically the optimal project. So when alpha equals to zero, everything is fully disentangled. Uh, exploitation is just whatever is the best. That's what you do. So the exploration, however, is, is, is uh, a little bit trickier. So now what happens here if you observe good news on one project, X? Well, if that project is, is the low project, then we're just back to the one safe project setting that I told you about. So, so now you wanna explore project H. If, if uh, by chance you got good news on project H, the high project, then, then this, is, this is fantastic. You're gonna exploit project H forever. Now, if you observe bad news on a project Y, then naturally you'll switch to exploiting the other project. Um, if you also get uh, uh, news that the other project is bad, then you know the world is not uh, is not a good place that day, and you can exploit whatever project you'd like. Both will generate zero, so it doesn't really matter. All right. So, what's the characterization of the optimal exploration strategy? This is the next proposition, which says that one of the following exploration strategies is optimal. So either you explore project L until you see good news, and after good news, switch to exploring project H, or you explore project H until you see good news. So in other words, um, you never switch exploration unless you get news. So this is in stark contrast to what we saw in the standard setting. 
So you're always sticking with exactly the same project in terms of exploration, unless you get news. Even the exploitation of projects is going to exhibit very limited number of switching. So in fact, the maximal number of switches you'll observe on the optimal policy is two. So let me give you a bit of a hand-waving intuition for where this is coming from. So, so this is a bit more intricate, so I'll just say this is truly hand-waving, so I hope you forgive me. Um, so let's suppose that the agent is relatively optimistic about Project X. So this means that she's going to exploit Project X. Now, uh, if, if she's sufficiently optimistic about Project X, when is information valuable for her? It's only valuable for her if it leads her to switch to exploiting the other project. So this suggests that she should explore myopically the inferior project Y, because uh, if she learns good news about Project X, she's already using Project X, that's not useful. The only useful thing is something that would tell her, oh, you should switch. And that's only news on, on Project Y. So in this case, if she's sufficiently optimistic about Project X, she should explore the other project. Okay, so, so now only good news can on, on project Y can cause an exploitation switch. That's the only case in which she'll, she'll change her actions. So the optimal exploitation in a, in a way here depends only on, on the good news arrival, but not on the bad news arrival. So in particular, we can assume that they coincide. So this is kind of a similar trick to the one we saw in the, in the one safe project case. So the optimal policy of exploration here will be the same, even if both uh, the good news and the bad news arrive at the same rate. Okay, but what happens in the both news case? If you don't see any news, it entails absolutely no information. Your posterior stays flat. So if you started out by exploring project Y, and in the both news case, you don't see any news, you should stay with project Y. If it was optimal before, it's optimal now. So you never wanna switch exploration here. So the optimal, uh, this should say exploration, I apologize, doesn't change. All right, but how, how, to, how do we actually start? So here, the, the cheat, the reason why it's, it's truly hand-waving is because we started out by supposing that you're super optimistic on one of the projects. But, but what happens before that, before we get there? Maybe there's a whole lot of switching in the beginning and then at some point you stabilize. So how do you choose what project to observe initially? Um, well, showing that you never want to do these swaps is a little bit more intricate. So for this length of a talk, I won't have time to go through it unless people ask me at the end. Uh, however, uh, let me kind of give you a sense of how, how you pick those projects initially. So, so one special case uh, is, is quite useful in seeing how you pick the projects. Uh, and that special case, which is admittedly a very knife edge case, is one where you're precisely indifferent between the two projects in terms of expected payoffs. So suppose that, that you're exactly indifferent. Uh, in this case, it's optimal to explore project H if and only if this inequality holds. So the, this inequality depends both on the arrival rates of either, either project and on the posterior of each project. Now, intuitively, you observe the project for which the posterior moves more rapidly. What, what do we mean by this? So the fact that it relates to the magnitude of the arrival rate, I think is pretty intuitive in the sense that if a project generates news very rapidly, it's more appealing to, to explore that project first. Um, why does it depend on one minus the, the posterior? Well, if you're very, very optimistic about a project, uh, then the likelihood that, that you're actually going to change your mind and switch projects is, is very low. 
So at that point, collecting information about that project is just not very valuable. So really, it's it's one minus the posterior that affects the value of information. It's it's uh, it's only when when you place sufficient probability on the project actually being bad, that's when you might see an effect on the exploitation strategy. So so that's kind of the value of information here is captured by this multiplication of the arrival rate and one minus the posterior. Okay, in particular, we, we can look at a special case, and, and this is a, a little bit of a, an abuse of, of uh, the, the model I started out with, but, but it will fit a little bit the lemma. So, so suppose that we have completely identical projects. Now, this is an abuse because we started out by saying that project H is actually strictly better than project L when they're both good, so allow me to, to kind of deviate for just one slide. Um, so, so here, everything is symmetric. So we start with a situation where the priors are the same, the potential rewards are the same, even the arrival rates are the same. And just for simplicity, think about a case where you're getting good news with a positive arrival rate and you never get bad news. So this case is kind of interesting for both the lemma and also to see kind of the distinction between the classical setting and the setting in which uh, exploration and exploitation are disentangled. So in the standard model, when alpha equals to one, we're exactly in this case that I told you about where the indices are exactly the same. So what you do is you mix between the projects equally. Until you get news, you mix, you mix equally. In our setting, once you exploit, uh, explore one arm uh, for even a minute uh, infinitesimal time, you're no longer indifferent in terms of expected payoff. So you're gonna exploit one arm and then you're gonna explore the other arm until you see news. Why do you only explore one arm? Why don't you mix your exploration? Well, uh, as I said, after an infinitesimal time, one project is going to be myopically optimal. That's the project you're, you're going to exploit. So the only value of information is getting you to switch from that project. Learning that this project is good is, is of no value because you're already using it. Uh, so if you mix, you learn that the alternative project is, is, is good and you might switch to it only at half the rate, the arrival rate. So you're just reducing the arrival rate of information that would be of use to you. And that's why that's actually suboptimal in our setting. All right, some comparative statics uh, um, before we conclude. So when, when agents become uh, increasingly impatient, they explore and exploit different projects. Um, when the arrival rate of information increases, you're more likely to explore that project. So this is kind of in line with this value of information that we just saw through the lemma. When the posterior decreases, uh, you're more likely to explore project X. So again, this is what we discussed uh, with the lemma. And finally, if, if RH is very, very high, you're very less likely to explore H. And again, this is because you're going to, ex uh, exploiting project H is going to be mu much more appealing and therefore the useful learning for you is about project L. All right, how about uh, uh, bad news? I won't go through the details uh, of it, but interestingly, it has very similar features. So suppose that the arrival rate of bad news is higher than that of good news. The optimal strategy uh, of exploration is the following. You explore project L for some period T, and then you explore, explore project H forever. So it's now a little bit different from the good news case, but still has this feature where you explore project L for a limited time, and then you explore project H indefinitely unless you see news. Now in the standard model, once you start uh, exploiting and exploring a project, if you see no news, you just become more and more optimistic about this project. So you never switch. So here, this entanglement actually leads you to potentially more switching. So you must switch uh, precisely once if you start from exploring project L, then the, the uh, inferior project in terms of rewards. 
All right. So um, uh, before I conclude, let me tell you about a bunch of applications we think this might be interesting for and that we've started thinking about. So, so in economics, at least, uh, this, this problem has been thought through very carefully in the context of collective action. Uh, so this idea of how do teams collectively experiment. Uh, and the underlying force in those models is free riding. So you have free riding and therefore suboptimal exploration and exploitation. Um, in our setting, when, when uh, exploration and exploitation are, are disentangled, the misalignment between agents and a team go away. So if you just translated the classical model to our disentangled setting, you'd get immediately efficiency, in fact, in, in collective exploration and exploitation. Uh, disentangled problem. So there seems to be kind of more uh, interesting stuff going on there, and we're we're just starting. Um, we also thought a bit about the inclusion of this in agency models. So you could think about one agent who explores, say, like an intelligence agency, and the other who exploits, like an executive. Uh, if they have conflicting objectives, then there might be a distortion of exploration in order to manipulate the decisions of the doer. And, and last, um, we also kind of are thinking about how to translate this sort of setting to a Pandora box setting, uh, which would match well on the job search models and climbing the job ladder uh frameworks um so just to conclude uh what we tried to show you here is a simple framework for disentangling exploration from exlo from exploitation um it covers many special cases including those that are kind of the best sellers in, in our literature um what i tried to convey is that this entanglement has substantial effects um the disentanglement is, is utilized non-trivially in the optimal policy. It affects the persistence of, of the project that's being explored or exploited. And the payoff impacts are particularly pronounced for intermediate parameters. So that's when disentanglement is particularly valuable. And, and hopefully it's useful for a variety of applications. And I hope that some of the questions will, will kind of tell us what might also be interesting to look at. Um, so that's all folks, thank you. Thank you very much Liat for that uh, very fascinating talk. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions. Uh, there were a few in the chat uh, that uh, Alessandro uh, answered, uh, but if anybody uh, has a question, please feel free to raise your hand and I'll call upon you to unmute yourself. Or feel free to place questions in the chat. Um, I see. Uh, go ahead, please. Uh, thanks, Aisha. So um, I would like to ask if it's possible for a very brief intuition on why the Gittins index thing is not working in this framework that you know she mentioned at the very beginning of her talk. Um, right. Okay. Maybe it's uh, it's useful to go through the picture that I started out with for even the one safe project. Um, so for example here, so, so if you look at the, well, actually maybe the, the previous picture might even be more useful. Uh, okay, so, so if you think about the, Gittin in, the Gittins index in this particular setting, what happens here? Well, there's a trade-off between myopically exploiting project age, you know, which potentially gives you the higher rewards or uh, um, uh, myopically exploiting Project L. Now, when it's myopically optimal to exploit Project L, that's the safe project. So that's if you exploit that in the standard setting, you get no information whatsoever. You just see the safe project. So, so think about you know, trying to find a vaccine for, for COVID. Um, and now you tell yourself, well, I can drink a glass of water or, or try this crazily risky vaccine. So if you drink the glass of water, it might, be, it might be very safe. It might be the optimal thing for you to do with no thinking about the future, but you'll learn nothing. The only way to learn about the vaccine is to actually try it. Um, so, so now what does the classical Gittins uh, literature say? Well, 
it says, well, maybe when you're not terribly pessimistic about the risky project, you should, you should still use it in order to get the information, right? Um, now, at the heart of this is the fact that the only way for you to learn is actually to use the project. But in many cases, we learn without using the project. So we might do a lot of research in the lab on particular medicines before we actually uh, take it ourselves. Um, so sometimes these are disentangled. So what happens at the very extreme where it's fully disentangled? So this means that you can exploit one project and explore a completely different one. So now in the exploration choice, there is no need for you to sacrifice payoffs. You're, you're just gonna do the optimal thing. The only thing you need to consider is kind of what's optimal to, to, um, to explore. Uh, in this case, the exploration is going to be just of the risky project. So it's gonna look very, very different. So this is exactly what uh, the next figure illustrated that even in this special case, the optimal strategies are gonna look very different. So the exploitation here is gonna have a, a bigger range of utilizing the safe project because you know you don't, there's no need for you to sacrifice payoffs as in the getting setting in order to learn. And the exploration here is always going to match what, where the information is, where is what's most valuable. Does this answer the question? Yeah, thank you. I get the intuition that, you know, we don't need that anymore. Yeah. Thanks very much. Any other questions? Please feel free to raise your hands. So I have a question. Um, if you have three projects, do you have a sense of how complicated the uh, optimal uh, exploration strategy can be for alpha equals zero, let's say. So can it be captured by indices that evolve based on news or uh, what would it look it's like? A, yeah, it's a, it's a terrific question <laughs> and a very hard one. So, so in this setting, we still don't have a great, we don't have a characterization for more than, than, than two Poisson bandits. Um, and it's hard for a variety of reasons. The one way where we extended the number of kind of potential projects is actually moving to a different setting. So, so we're now thinking of kind of a complementary project that looks at the uh, Pandora box problem. So this is a case where, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's, uh, it's where you have a bunch of boxes, each is associated with a, with a probability of a prize inside uh, and then magnitude of a prize. And, and you need to open the box in order to figure out the price. So in that case, you can think of many, many boxes. So this is an analogy to, to hear, but the information pro generation process is much simpler in the sense that once you open the box, you immediately learn whether it's good or bad. Um, so in that case, we have some characterizations, but here you're spot on. I mean, it's, it's very hard. So this is already kind of not, not, not trivial. Uh, Got it, thanks. I should also say that at least in economics, actually, it, interestingly, most of the models assume two projects. This is a lame excuse, but, but it is the case. Of course. <laughs> so in Pandora's box, there is a natural separation between you observe things and you gather information uh, uh, in one way, and then uh, exploitation is uh, in some ways separate uh, through selection. So it captures yes. some of the um, yeah, same aspects. Um, Rod, you have a question, please. Uh, yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, so have you uh, thought about uh, any way of uh, rephrasing either the exploration problem or the exploitation problem? as a new instance of best arm identification, but probably with a different uh, reward function. 
So uh, you probably know this literature better than us. So when we looked at it, what we saw was different uh, approaches. Some of them, uh, at least the first papers that we could we could see, uh, relied on kind of no regret algorithms, and those are very hard for us to assess. It's also a somewhat different problem, even though it's highly related, because. Uh, in our problem, the, the rewards throughout the process actually matters. And in the best arm identification, you're not really thinking about these discounted rewards that are happening throughout the way. So one consideration kind of goes out the window. And, and for intermediate values of discount rates, that really, really matters. So I'm not sure there is a direct way to translate them, but there might be a deeper relation that we haven't yet kind of uh, uncovered. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I think we'll uh, take other questions offline. Uh, thank you again, Liat, for uh, being here and giving us this fascinating talk. And thanks everyone for attending.